On behalf of the Simon Perry Center for Constitutional Democracy and the College of Liberal Arts, I'm pleased to welcome you to our second lecture in the Amicus Curiae Lecture Series. This lecture series is made possible by a grant from the West Virginia Humanities Council, and we're very grateful for that. They've asked us for feedback, and that's why you've all been handed a form as you walked in, and we'd appreciate it very much if you'd fill it out and drop it on your way out. As I said, if you were here at our first lecture, uh, when I introduced the speaker, Jean Edward Smith, amicus curiae means friend of the court. This lecture series is presented uh, as part of Marshall University's wish to be a friend to the community. We're committed to studying the principles and concepts related to constitutional democracy, and we want to share our work and the things that we learn with our community. So we're very happy to see so many people from Huntington out here tonight with us. Tonight, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Jonathan O'Neill, who's the chairman of the history department at Georgia Southern University in Statesboro, Georgia. He earned his bachelor's degree at Colgate University and his master's and PhD from the University of Maryland. He's the author of the book, Originalism in American Law and Politics, A Constitutional History, and he is now working on his second book, Constitutional Knowledge and Maintenance, Constitutional Knowledge and Constitutional Maintenance in the 20th Century America. Tonight, Dr. O'Neill will discuss the concept of originalism and its meaning in history in American law and politics. At the end of the lecture, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. I hope you'll take advantage of it. And for now, please join me in welcoming Dr. O'Neill. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and uh, first, let me extend my thanks to Marshall University and to Dean David Pittenger for inviting me here this evening. Um, I've been looking forward to this, for, uh, to this for a long time, and I'm greatly honored by it. So thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, this evening, I want to talk about originalism, um, first somewhat philosophically, uh, about where it, what its claims are, about where it stands in the Western rule of law tradition, and also about what is entailed by rejecting or negating it. And then I will turn to its emergence in recent American constitutional history and try to explain uh, why it came back uh, with such force and such prominence and significance. And I'll do that by uh, reflecting a little bit on both uh, academic constitutional theory and the practice of the Supreme Court. Now, uh, the basic idea of originalism, unsurprisingly, is that the Constitution means now what it meant to the people who wrote and ratified. It does not change uh, with time, although it can be amended or misinterpreted. Um, and also, uh, we could say this in the more fancy language of constitutional theory, which I will try to stay away from and, and call on only when needed. But one of the things the constitutional theorists who argue on behalf of originalism say is that originalism means that the meaning of the Constitution was fixed at the time of the founding. Um, and also they say it is constraining. It constrains those who speak in its name and apply it on law, uh, apply it as law, uh, including judges who speak in its name and apply it as law. So uh, because we have a written constitution, a text, originalism in this sense depends on the idea that a text actually can uh, limit and constrain meaning in this way. And therefore it depends on the idea that uh, and one author or authors at one set of time can communicate via a text to a reader at a later point in time. Um, now, I submit uh, at the outset that this, in, in fact, is possible, and as is evidenced by our gathering here this evening, right? At some point along the line, you saw an email, a flyer, a website that announced the time, topic, and venue of this evening's talk. Uh, you interpreted that text. Uh, according to the conventions of written English and the overall context in which you saw the text, and voila, here you are. Right? Proof that evidence, uh, or evidence that communication through a text can actually occur. Now, I acknowledge that uh, interpreting a legal text created in 1787 is a bit more complex than that. 
Um, but in principle, I want to insist that constitutionalism and the rule of law based on a written constitution depend on this idea that text, a text can carry meaning from one point in time to another. And I'd like to uh, elaborate on that crucial point for a moment by using a pretty famous example uh, from the literature and the philosophy of law, uh, or excuse me, the literature and the philosophy of language. Um, and it's, the example is this. Imagine that you are walking along a nice beach somewhere, um, uh, about sunset, let's say. And as you're walking along the beach, you come upon a text. Let's say a Wordsworth poem, the first stanza of a famous Wordsworth poem. And you see that, that first stanza etched in the sand. I think your automatic assumption would be that one of your fellow beachgoers earlier had etched this stanza of poetry into the sand, right? And as you're gazing at this stanza etched into the sand, another wave comes in, washes away the first stanza, and leaves the second stanza of the poem. Now, what would your reaction be? I think uh, one of two things. You either have to posit um, that the ocean is somehow communicating to you, right, some kind of sentient being heretofore understood and is communicating to you through its penchant for romantic poetry, or you have to conclude that uh, you've happened upon some unknown discovered of process of erosion or percolation that is somehow leaving something that looks like the stanza of this poem. Um, in the first case, you posited, posited an author, right? The sentient ocean, the haunting Wordsworth. In the second case, you've posited an explanation for something that explains why this is in fact not an author, right? So, I, or, or, te or a text that, that is authored by someone, right? And I think that, that that example clarifies that without the concept of intent behind communication, the very notion of a text or of interpretation doesn't make any sense. It loses its, its meaning. Now, originalism depends on that kind of basic claim about what a text is and what it is for, what it does. Um, and I also want to say, uh, and shift gears a little bit now, to say that originalism is also rooted in some very old ideas about uh, the nature of law and what it means to live under law as opposed to living under arbitrary or tyrannical rule. Now, on, only by understanding these two issues, first about the, the, the first point about what a text is, and the second point about really, I, I think we have to say about what law is and why it is superior um, to, to other ways of rule, I think that understanding those two things will help explain why originalism retains its hold on us and kind of comes back. The, the last part of the talk, I'll explain the, the historical circumstances in which these kind of ideas get traction. Um, now, to state my, my central point boldly, Originalism defends the long-established Western idea that law manifests the human community's politics or values, its sense of justice, and its sense of what the proper role of government is. And it further upholds the principle that equally applied law is superior to arbitrary and authoritarian rule. We can call this idea the rule of law. And originalism holds with the rule of law tradition that the law can do these things despite failing to do perfect justice in every case and despite inevitably having indeterminacy or vagueness at the point at which it is applied. And finally, uh, with the rule of law tradition, originalism says that it's only by maintaining the inevitably imperfect rule of law that it is possible morally and politically to criticize the law as it is so that it might be altered to become something better than what it is. It's only first by abiding by the rule of law that we can change the established law into something better than what it is. Now, uh, this way of thinking about law, uh, what it is, and what its value is, and what its limitations are, goes back a very long way. Um, and in fact, I'm going to use an example that uh, goes back really to the beginning of, of um, Western, the Western philosophical tradition. It's an example from uh, Plato's Crito, the dialogue Crito, in which we find its namesake um, remonstrating, begging, arguing with Socrates to leave democratic Athens after he has been sentenced to death by the powers that be. And Socrates responds to his friend Crito by imagining what the laws might say to Socrates were he, in fact, to flee to Thessaly and flee his death sentence. 
and I'm going to quote here a little bit. He says that the laws might respond this way. <coughs> Excuse me. Having brought you into the world and nurtured and educated you and given you and every other citizen a share in the good things we have to author, we proclaim that every Athenian, when he comes of age, might leave and take his things with him if he does not like the ways of the city, and none of us laws will stand in his way. So the laws of Athens seem to be saying, if you come of age and you stay, you agree to live by the laws. And in this situation, the laws seem to be saying those who disobey um, do, the, do injustice because Socrates has made an agreement with us that he will obey our commands and he neither no obeys them nor convinces us that our commands are wrong. Obey the laws of Athens or convince them that they don't serve justice as well as they might. Now, Socrates wants to preserve a regime like democratic Athens where there's at least the opportunity for philosophers to argue with the law about justice and what justice requires. And he knows that a chance to improve the law uh, outside of such regimes will not be tolerated. So to preserve Athens and with it the opportunity for philosophy to make the law more just, he drinks the hemlock and dies. Here we see, I think, how law and obedience to law's commands preserves the regimes that permit themselves to be argued with, to be criticized, to be philosophized in. But I think we also see in this example that when that happens, there will be occasions in which uh, the law in enforcing the community's sense of justice, as it, as it did on Socrates, um, will actually do injustice in the particular circumstances of the case, in this case, uh, killing the, the greatest philosopher of all time. Um, but I still think at the end of the day, what Plato wants us to see in the Crito is that the imperfection of the rule of law can't be a reason for rejecting the rule of law. And I think on that turns uh, much of the core of the rule of law tradition. There's another way of understanding uh, how the rule of law is a second best option, how it's not perfect, but it is still good. And for the Greeks, uh, this was uh, by understanding that one alternative might be the rule of the philosopher king whose wisdom uh, is so great that he can perceive what justice requires in the particulars of every case. But philosopher kings were in short supply in ancient Athens as they are today. And so in the West, instead, we have turned to the rule of law. That's emphasized in, in, in uh, Plato's laws. It's emphasized in the politics of Aristotle. People are flawed, so human law inevitably falls short of perfect rule. Yet because it also partakes of reason and justice, it can be far superior to arbitrary rule. So the famous portion of the politics Aristotle says, one who asks the law to rule is held to be asking God and reason alone to rule. But one who asks man adds the beast. What could that mean? He says that, it, and he glosses a little bit further by saying, this is because spiritedness perverts rulers and even the best men. Having only imperfect men, we shy away from the philosopher king and instead let the law manifest the politics of our regime. Aristotle says then in, in this conception, instead of the philosopher king, that the law can be reason without passion. Men will always have passion in them. The law is reasonable because it is general and established before uh, in advance of its application. And so it can be steady and impartial. That's both its, its virtue and its vice in a sense. But a judge relying only on himself will tend to rule in his own interest or according to his particular desires or his sense of the good against that of the community. From this perspective, the value of the rule of law is that it insulates us from the arbitrary and tyrannical self-interested rule of individuals. And we go a little bit further on this point, I think, and say that if enough people believe that judges decide based on their own sense of justice rather than the law, which is the community's sense of justice, then the law begins to lose the qualities that citizens need in order to, to think of it as obligatory. And indeed, Aristotle emphasizes in, in the same passage in the politics um, that ruling merely according to one's own desires is the hallmark of tyranny. He says, where the laws do not rule, there is no regime. Where the laws do not rule, there are masters and slaves, but not citizens. Because citizens are free to urge the law to change and to remonstrate with it about what justice requires. The citizen has a share in ruling, he has a share in making the law, he has a share in applying the law. 
Now, from that perspective, I think that another way that the rule of law makes its claim of legitimacy on us is because it is in this way, as I've just described, that it reflects our capacity to be self-governing, reasonable individuals. Individuals who can tell the difference between being ruled by a, a process in which they participate with their human reason on one hand and on the other being ruled arbitrarily by the will of another. Now, I promise to get to the Americans right, in due course, but not yet. Um, I want to, uh, before I do get to the Americans, uh, shift our attention first uh, briefly to 17th century England, which is the most immediate referent for the 18th century American constitutional founding. Judges in the English common law tradition um, that the Americans grew out of used their reason um, and their human reason in the law to enact what they understood as the, the requirements of immemorial custom uh, and reason and nature. Now central among the, their, what they saw when they appealed to reason and nature uh, was the need to protect individual liberty and property, particularly from the grasping hands of the crown. Now, um, over time, this conflict between, on the one hand, the common law with its appeals to reason, its desire to pre protect liberty and property, allies with parliament, on the other hand, is the crown, right? Now, over the course of the 17th century in England, that leads to civil war um, and eventually a fundamental constitutional shift in the way that England is governed. Plays out in the, in the English Civil War in the 1640s and in the Glorious Revolution at the end of the 17th century. Out of that conflict comes uh, the writings of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, whom our founders read very carefully and are influenced by. Uh, now, what I'm suggesting is that in England in the 17th century, it's, the place is just awash with very fundamental arguments about uh, what reason requires, what constitutes legitimate rule, what is the proper place of religion in political life, um, how far can the state legitimately touch you and for what reasons. Now that contest turns bloody in much of Europe in the modern period, uh, and as it does in England during the Civil War. And as, as in the course of that dynamic, um, what we have come to call liberalism becomes the solution to this problem. Right? The primary goal of liberalism, as expressed particularly in the thought of Locke, was to shelter, uh, was to be a shelter from ongoing um, and, and messy and bloody political religious conflict. And it sought to do this by protecting uh, the, the individual legally from the reach of government. And it sort of generated uh, um, um, philosophies and reasons about how to do this and why it was, it, uh, how it could be done, why it was just to do this. And the core of how it did that, um, and this is especially in Hobbes, um, is by basing itself on the human passion for self-interest. Uh, excuse me, for self-preservation. It's a form of self-interest, I guess. And defining the, the human passion for self-preservation as a right. In this view, law now becomes the power uh, of the sovereign. The sovereign becomes the power of the law, whose job it is to protect rights, right? So you cede power to the, to the sovereign and the authority of the law that the sovereign wields to protect your rights. Kind of basic social contract theory. And again, this is all to repeat, um, to preserve the individual and to sort of set a distance between the individual and the power of government in order to achieve kind of peace and stability in the wake of these thoroughgoing religious political conflicts. Individual liberty and limited government are seen as the way to achieve this. So Hobbes says that the, uh, the sovereign has absolute power and uh, if he needs to, he can exercise violence in order to enforce his law. Locke comes along, softens the presentation of Hobbes a bit, uh, probably not his ultimate premises, and adds to Hobbes' primordial right to life the, the corollary rights to liberty and property, which we have come to call natural rights, life, liberty, and property. Equally important, Locke takes the idea of sovereignty and turns it into the idea of popular sovereignty. The sovereign is no longer a monarch, an individual, but it is the people as a whole. And they decide to consent right, um, to whatever form of government they feel best protects their rights. So government becomes an artifact. right? It is created by the people to protect their, their natural rights 
um, it also uh, may be destroyed, rebelled against when it fails in its essentially fiduciary capacity of, of creating, the, uh, of protecting their rights. Now that I think, you know, with a little bit more extrapolation is essentially um, to the theory of the American Revolution. After all, the Americans revolt uh, to protect their rights and their property and to protect uh, what they understand to be their right to be governed with their own consent. The Constitution, from this perspective, is meant to establish uh, the rule of law and limited consent-based government, and, and to therefore to, rec to, to stand as the fundamental law of a self-governing people that is devoted to individual liberty. And it is, it is in, this, in this sense, is understood, it is, it is the thing that separates and, and, and creates the limitations on government in the interest of individual liberty. Um, now, in order for the Constitution to, to serve that kind of separating function, uh, to limit government on one hand and protect rights on the other hand, um, and, and in order for us to be able to criticize where that constitutional line of separation may be drawn at any given point in time, depends upon the premise that we must first agree the Constitution has some fixed meaning that we can identify and restate. Um, if that's not true, then the Constitution will have failed in its attempt uh, to limit government and protect rights and secure uh, the consent of the governed. So again, I, I want to repeat that in the history of political thought, uh, the conception of the rule of law that the American Constitution is part of is designed to bring about protection for the individual and uh, security and stability in wake of the kind of bloody uh, confrontations of 17th century England in particular. The Americans as 18th century liberals see a written fundamental law um, based on consent as the best way to achieve this peace and stability and to end these kind of protracted uh, bloody struggles over first principles. Now, that kind of, of overview of the rule of law tradition is what stands behind and informs uh, my own attempt to try to understand where originalism, uh, uh, where, when and how originalism comes back uh, into the, the public eye and, and why it does so with such, uh, which, with such traction and influence. Um, now, the founding of America was, was based on a written text, a written fundamental law, in just the ways that I've been describing. And because of this, uh, the American founders, most of whom were lawyers uh, and were trained in the English common law tradition, when they create this text, they, they approach it, they interpret it in the way that they've been taught to do uh, with any other legal text. Uh, to interpret is to attempt to restate the author's intent. intent. Now, you see that in, in John Locke and Locke's writings. You see it uh, in William Blackstone, great English jurist of the, of the late 18th century who all the Americans read and have on their shelf. You see it in the Federalist Papers, this understanding of interpretation. You see it in the first Congress that begins to set up the various uh, executive branches of government uh, under the authority of the Constitution. You see it in some of the most important opinions of Chief Justice John Marshall. And you see it even as late in America as the Reconstruction period and the addition of the amendments after the Civil War. So what I'm saying is that as, as time goes on in America, this, this sort of basic understanding of, of um, what a text does in the rule of law tradition um, is more assumed and taken for granted than it is kind of articulated and defended over and over again. Um, there doesn't need to be uh, serious um, and, and theoretical defenses of it because no one is really questioning it, right? Um, it's assumed, we could say that it's, it's strong, but it's untheorized. Now, uh, that situation um, arrive, uh, well, holds true until really the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and there's a fundamental shift in this period, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, in the way that people begin to think about law, about interpretation, about judging, and really about what knowledge itself is and how it is constituted. Um, and this ushers in what some uh, scholars have called the era of modern judicial power, distinguishing it from traditional, and we could say traditional originalist conceptions of judicial power. Model, modern judicial power is informed by this other shift that people have referred to as the revolt against formalism. That people who, people who think, um, write, and argue, uh, lawyers, politicians, even novelists, um, newspaper authors, begin to reject what we could call categorical or deductive ways of thinking, and they began to reject originalist ways of thinking. And what begins to push those ways of thinking aside are things like pragmatism, Darwinism, um, and a sort of general belief that uh, in reform and progress that things will always be getting better. 
Um, in the law, this, is, it, this takes the form of what is called legal realism and sociological jurisprudence, which are associated with Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., who was a very famous uh, Supreme Court justice in the early part of the 20th century. And Holmes sort of begins to, is, is, the, is the harbinger of these kind of ideas and defends them in the way that, that he approaches constitutional cases and the way that he, he argues and talks about law. Um, now, I'd say w without um, going too far off into abstraction that these modern schools of thought basically say that, that the indeterminacy and the indiscretion in law really make it impossible to distinguish law from politics or law from the will of the judge. The law is what judges do at the moment of supposedly applying a law that precedes them. Now, a shorthand for those, those modern developments that I've been describing um, has come to be this, the, the phrase, a living constitution. And the living constitution idea replaces the traditional originalist understanding of interpretation that I started out talking about. Um, it also underlies the major constitutional changes of the New Deal in the 1930s. And in this crucial period, and we're talking here about really the, the, the first yeah, three, four decades of the 20th century, it's certainly solidified by the time of World War II, the constitutional interpretation itself is, is reconceived and redefined. As traditionally understood, it was an effort to ascertain and apply the original intent of those who created the document. And now it becomes an activity in which the Supreme Court and its discretion updates the Constitution to its own view of justice and to what the times require. Um, that is what, uh, in, in many respects, underlies uh, the, the New Deal of the 1930s. And then um, in the 1960s, a new generation of liberals come along and argue that just what we need um, is more of the living Constitution, more ad adaptation of the Constitution by judges. Um, and, and the court begins to, to go down this path. And as it does so, um, it, its decisions become uh, more controversial, more polarizing, and more susceptible to being argued against in historical terms. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but to put it another way, an uh, uh, increasing number of, of, of citizens, office holders, commentators, um, scholars, uh, began to say that irrespective of, irrespective of the laudable results that the court is beginning to reach in the 60s, um, that it's starting to do so through a process that looks more like the will of the judges than the original meaning of the Constitution. Um, now, not many people know, for example, that in Brown versus Board of Education, the f famous school desegregation case of 1954, uh, the court specifically asked the litigants to go and research and argue to it about what the original meaning of the 14th Amendment was. They dutifully do this. When they come back, um, the court uh, disregards their findings because the, the findings don't lend themselves to getting to the result of desegregation. Um, it becomes uh, the, the original meaning of the 14th Amendment and other parts of the Constitution become a part of a lot of very uh, uh, important litigation in the 60s and early 70s surrounding legislative apportionment, how you count how many um, uh, representatives someone has in the State House or in Congress, public accommodations, um, who can go into what sort of businesses, can there be any restrictions, a lot of this is around race, of course, school prayer, is a constitutional to pray in schools, and the right of privacy, which uh, eventually ends up um, sort of, of transmogrifying into uh, the right to an abortion. So in these kind of cases and commentary, which are very consequential, very divisive, very politically charged, uh, many people began to see a serious gap between what they thought the Constitution had always meant and what the court is now saying it means in the context of these issues. Um, in that dynamic, the originalist idea that I've been describing is kind of hanging out there uh, as a standard of judgment or as a standard of measurement and a way, as a way of criticizing some of these, uh, these decisions, both in their results and the process by which they were reached. And, and the, the originalists began arguing that what the court is doing, as I suggested a minute ago, looks too much uh, like will and not enough like the rule of law and the uh, idea in the Western tradition. I think it's also uh, worth adding at this point that uh, it's clear that in the late 60s and early 70s that this old idea of judicial self-restraint is breaking down. Uh, the court is not restraining itself, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, now this is, this is a crucial shift too because since uh, before the New Deal of the 1930s, 
it was always the liberals, the people on the liberal end of the political uh, spectrum who were critical of the Supreme Court for being too activist, for being too willful, and sometimes for disregarding the original intent of the Constitution. Um, but by the late 60s, um, that argument has moved, uh, the liberals have moved away from the embrace of judicial restraint and are now um, embracing an activist court that updates the living Constitution to, the, to their own sense of justice. Um, so at, at what I'm saying is that the end, at the end of the 1960s and the early 1970s, constitutional theory in this way has come to a crossroads, right? The, the, the liberal, uh, political liberals have abandoned their own stance of judicial self-restraint and have embraced the new stance of the kind of living, updated constitution, updated by the court, because they're getting the results they want out of that dynamic. So too, uh, at that crossroads, um, the originalist idea begins to have purchase or appeal to people who think that the court is doing too much too fast. Um, they, they began to think that maybe the originalist idea, now that the self-restraint idea has been abandoned, maybe the originalist idea would be better at drawing some kind of limitation on the court. Uh, okay. Uh, so that's sort of where we are by uh, the late 60s and early 70s. and, and um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll add one more piece uh, to that puzzle in just a second. Before I do the, that, that, though, I think it, it's probably more appropriate to, to say just a, a few words about who is leading originalism, uh, let's say, by the mid-70s. Um, <coughs> excuse me. One famous name is Raoul Berger. Um, who actually was a New Deal liberal and didn't sort of change with the times in the abandonment of self-restraint and, and go in for judicial activism. Berger wrote a very famous, very influential book in 1977, the title of which was Government by Judiciary. He says that this is the direction that this shift is bringing us to. Um, Another better known was Robert Bork, uh, who was a law professor at Yale uh, and later a nominee to the Supreme Court in 1987. Um, a, a third would be William Rehnquist, uh, who wrote some very influential things about originalism in the 70s, um, was put on the court, and then eventually became Chief Justice in the 1990s. And so throughout the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, um, th these three leaders, I would call them, and but also a whole coterie of others, are arguing in historical terms. They're making arguments about what a text means in the terms that I've already described. They're trying to amass historical evidence that what you say the 14th Amendment means uh, now, it didn't actually mean to the people who wrote it. And they're rejecting this new sort of liberal turn uh, as an affront to the traditional American understanding of the rule of law and of the separation of powers. They're saying that the judges are, are in effect acting too much like legislators and not enough like judges. So um, what I've just sort of sketched out, I would call, uh, have called the crossroads in constitutional thought at the end of the 60s and 1970s. And, and, and so the, the sort of the, the, the musical chairs are shifting and people with different political views are taking up different kinds of arguments to defend their position than what they previously had done. Um, now, just as that is happening in the late 60s and 1970s, um, there's another major shift in American politics that is happening in tandem th with this, um, and that is really the crack up of the Democratic New Deal coalition, the coalition that had come together, the co coalition of interests that had come together in the Democratic Party in the 1930s uh, to support the New Deal, um, is beginning to fragment at the end of the 1960s. Um, and this coalition had dominated national politics you know, for, for most of the middle decades of the 20th century. It's starting to become, its components are becoming alienated from one another uh, at the end of the 60s. And its unity is, is a thing of the past by the 1970s. Now, there are many reasons uh, for why the, the Democratic Party, the interest groups in the Democratic Party can't get along anymore. Um, some of those are actually to do with some Supreme Court decisions of the kind that I've just mentioned. Uh, there, are, there are many other reasons. But what I want to say now is that some of those people who had been in the Democratic coalition in the 1960s by the mid-1970s are beginning uh, to think about voting Republican. And in fact, many of those people are the people who helped elect Reagan for the first time in 1980. So what I'm saying is this: it's the end of the New Deal coalition um, combined with the rise of this new sort of political conservatism and th that it, that in one of the ways it manifests itself as a criticism of the court. It's, it's the breakdown of the New Deal coalition in tandem with the rise of the new conservatism that sort of create an audience or an opportunity, or we might say a political space for the originalist idea to have uh, adherence or influence or traction again. Um, and that's particularly true because in this context, the originalist tendency to constrain the court actually suggests or augurs more conservative policy results than the recent decisional trends of the court in the 60s and the 70s.
So originalism is, is gaining adherence to the 70s um, and 80s. It is uh, beginning to influence the litigation strategy of the Reagan administration, how the Reagan administration argues cases when it's in front of the Supreme Court. It's beginning to affect uh, who Reagan nominates to be judges um, on, the, on the Supreme Court and lower federal courts, especially while uh, Ed Meese is Attorney General. These developments, of course, come to the most uh, widespread public attention in the nomination of Robert Bork to the Supreme Court in the summer of 1987. Uh, Bork had been defending originalism for a long time. Originalism is a huge issue in the nomination hearings. Bork is defeated, um, but originalism lives on after the Bork defeat, after the nomination is, is, is um, voted down. And it continues to develop among academics uh, and on the Supreme Court. Um, it, throughout the 1990s, and in fact, uh, in the late 90s and into today, uh, there's actually been a variable explosion in, in publication on originalism. There are two very important books actually that just come out this year that I'm in the in, in process of, of reading. There's now a Center for the Study of Constitutional Originalism at the Law School of the University of San Diego. Uh, in the 1990s, there were several influential Supreme Court decisions that were argued in originalist terms uh, when Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, was on the bench. And more recently, um, in that regard, I think we only need to think of, of the case of Washington, D.C. versus Heller, uh, decided in 1908, very important case, or 1908, 2008, um, 100 years later. Uh, in which uh, the court says that uh, there is an individual right uh, to carry a gun for the purposes of self-defense. Um, and I want to carry over Heller for just a minute. Um, the, the majority opinion written by Scalia um, <clears throat> is, is worth reading just a chunk of, because it's, it's a place where the, it doesn't happen very often, where the court is very explicit about the interpretive methodology that it's using. And it's very explicit about the, the originalist interpretive methodology it's using. Um, in this, this key section of the Heller opinion, Scalia says this. Um, in interpreting the text, we are guided by the principle that the Constitution was written to be understood by the voters. Its words and phrases were used in their normal and ordinary, as distinguished from their technical meaning. Normal meaning may, of course, include an idiomatic meaning, but it excludes secret or technical meanings that would not have been known to ordinary citizens in the founding generation. Now, that seems to me to be a pretty accurate description of the core idea of originalism. Um, and it expresses also, I think, some of the key reasons why it endures. Uh, it continues, uh, originalism continues to develop and endure and, and attract uh, serious adherence because of, uh, it speaks to our shared con conception of what a text is, and in particular, what a legal text is for. And also, as I noted uh, a minute ago, timing helped, right? Um, originalism reasserts that kind of idea about a text and a text in the rule of law tradition just at the time when uh, the New Deal order is cracking up and there's the rise of what has been called the new conservatism. So there's an audience for this, the reassertion of this idea about a legal text. Um, additionally, we could say uh, you know, that Originalism, I think, dramatizes or clarifies that how one approaches the Constitution, how one interprets the Constitution, um, really does affect whose political morality is going to rule on some of the most important policy issues of the day. And here we could uh, list things like abortion, affirmative action, gun ownership, the role of religion in public life. All of those things bring up originalist kinds of questions, and all of them are still with us. And frequently, when the court has turned to them, it has turned to, to originalist arguments regarding them. <clears throat> so as I've been emphasizing this evening, um, this all kind of depends on this old idea that for the rule of law to be real, a text must have some meaning, must have some content that can be identified before it's applied. Only if that contest, content exists uh, and is applied is it possible to distinguish what the law is from what it is not uh, and to inhabit the ground from which the content of the law as it is can be criticized and perhaps changed or improved. That brings me uh, to one final point that I, I'd like to, to tease out just for a moment before I close, um, which is that scholars in this field lately have been emphasizing what I think is a very important distinction, and which helps clarify some of these issues. Um, and that distinction is between interpreting the Constitution and constructing or construing the Constitution. Uh, to interpret is to be an originalist because interpretation is an attempt to restate what the author of a text was attempting to communicate by writing it. But construction is what happens when interpretation does not yield a determinate or clear meaning, or perhaps any meaning that is relevant to the issue at hand. 
Perhaps there's a, a completely unforeseen political problem that the founders had nothing to say about, or perhaps more likely um, that the, the, te the text they left us is relevant, but it's vague or unclear in application. It is susceptible to a range of possible meanings. At that point, we construct the Constitution, taking what we do know about its language, about its principles, about its structures, and debating with one another about how these things should inform and guide us as we deal with the unforeseen circumstance that we confront. Now, construction understood in this way is a political, creative process, which calls upon the, 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 the components of our constitutional system to try to deal with problems or situations that the constitutional text itself doesn't contemplate or doesn't clearly resolve. Now, as such, uh, construction should be the purview of citizens and, and, and office holders who are politically responsible to citizens. Um, rarely, if ever, should it be the purview of judges. Judges have the legal job of interpretation, not the political job of construction. And now I think one of the, the key things that is done by the interpretation construction distinction is that it admits that originalism can't solve every question that comes up. When interpretation runs out, we have politics. But undertaking the politics of construction um, happens because first, we search for whatever original meaning was available. And we do this because uh, a, a text can communicate meaning from one point in time to another, and because we are bound by that meaning if we believe in the, the rule of law and limited government. So, uh, and, and I'll, add, I'll add this. Um, understood in that way, originalism is not really the same thing as the old idea of judicial self-restraint. Right? Um, if the original meaning can be known, then courts should vigorously apply it. Right? Uh, if a legislative act has violated the known original meaning of the Constitution, then courts shouldn't defer to the legislature just because it's a legislature. A court should strike it down and not simply defer to it. Now, um, having said that, uh, I think it's fair to say that a thoroughly originalist court, which we have never seen, um, would do less than what courts have been doing for the last several decades. Um, and again, to, to repeat, when original intent runs out, we should have politics. And um, that, I think it, it should be made clear, would cast more responsibility on us as citizens and on the office holders we elect. And it would cast responsibility on us to, de to deliberate and argue with one another about what our principles require in practice. And I say that that is as it should be in a self-governing republic that is dedicated to the rule of law. We've become far too accustomed to courts sorting out our political problems for us um, and not taking on the burden of being political enough ourselves. And we've been, been far too tolerant of, of ceding that responsibility to courts and allowing them to do it based on dubious or just wrong interpretations of the Constitution. Um, so in, in that context, I say that you know, the alternative, in my mind, to originalism is to equate legal argument with moral argument or philosophical argument which would destroy the rule of law, and with it, the authority of the Supreme Court. Now, if the authority of the, if the uh, court dissipates and people believe that, uh, as I suggested earlier, that it's no longer um, applying the law or interpreting the law, but kind of making it up according to its own moral judgments as it goes along, um, then that's the kind of, of, of dynamic that leads us back to the bloody chaos um, that first brought about liberal constitutionalism 300 years ago. And I don't think any of us would want to go there, right? Um, so because we would not want that, I think, we have to accept that the rule of law, uh, particularly in America, where we have a written constitution, requires originalism and it requires um, some dedication to procedure. On the other hand, I think we have to concede that any legal system will contain discretion and indeterminacy, um, as will any appeal to historical evidence by originalists when they're arguing. Um, given that that is the case, I think once, once again uh, we're back to Aristotle's insistence that the rule of law ultimately will still require character and virtue in judges. Or we might say having judges who are dedicated to the principles of the regime. You don't want, as judges, people who are opposed to the principles of the regime or who are bent on exploiting its inevitable indeterminacy in order to instantiate their own view of justice. You want instead those who will defer to the community's sense of justice as expressed in the law of their own sense of justice. So at the end of the day, the defenders of the rule of law have to defend the Constitution as having a real meaning that binds us um, and have to defend the integrity of the legal process as a process. Now, 
Uh, I concede once again, as, as I did at the outset, that this is imperfect. Um, but still, this is the, our best alternative to arbitrary or authoritarian rule. This will mean uh, that one's preferred political outcomes will sometimes lose, that my preferred political outcomes will sometimes lose. But that is the price worth paying for a form of government in which we are free to debate about justice, to worship our God, and to philosophize. Thank you.